the transparency obligation is extremely difficult to comply with. Um, to be able to actually list all or most of the copyright material an AI, generative AI provider is including in their training data is, is, is a good aspiration, but it needs to come with a clear identification of actually who these rights belong to and so on. And this is impossible. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Alina Trapova. Dr. Trapova is a lecturer in intellectual property law at University College London and a co-director of the Institute for Brand and Innovation Law. She is also one of the co-managing editors at the Kluwer Copyright Blog. Before joining Academia, Alina has worked in private practice as well as at the EU Intellectual Property Office and the International Federation for the Phonographic Industry, also called IFP. So, Alina, one of your articles caught my attention, uh, namely your analysis on copyright for AI-generated works, where you ask the question, is it a task for the inter internal market? So could you outline in less than five minutes um, what your key findings are? Sure. Um, thank you very much, uh, Caroline, for this invitation. And um, less than five minutes is a bit of a challenge, but let's see how that goes. Um, I'm very pleased, though, to be able to contribute even briefly to the debate on this topic. So um, very, very briefly at the outset, a little bit on the context of these issues. The discussion on AI and copyright is basically twofold, if I can simplify it in that way. On the one hand, we talk about the input issue, so what goes with the copyright infringement and potential exceptions with respect to the training process, to the training data. And on the other hand, uh, we talk about the output. So whatever the machine spits out, whether that is potentially protectable with copyright and IP in general. Now, uh, there's a lot written on both aspects, uh, and the paper that you referred to focuses on the output side of questions, even though it, fear, it, it turns out that in practice, the input is what is disturbing um, litigation more, as we have cases now coming up on that question in the US and, and in the UK. Coming back to the paper, um, the output question can be reduced to the, the legal output question can be reduced to the following. Um, does copyright subsist in a work generated with or by AI, with the assistance of it or by it? This goes around very interesting questions of authorship, free and creative choices, originality. I, will not, I don't go into that in this paper, uh, but um, I, I come to, I take it from the position that there are some works where actually human free and creative choices might be absent. Uh, and that creates a public domain result. So it creates a, real, a result in which these works are not protected with copyright. So I pose the big question of whether one day the EU legislator would wake up and say, well, let's expand copyright to cover that kind of works uh, because there might be a market failure because AI industry, the AI industry has to be incentivized in one way or another. Um, so I look at this issue of extending copyright protection from a competences, EU legislative competences perspective and the internal market. Basically, is this public domain status of these works going to disturb the internal market? to the extent that the legislator has to intervene. So um, this is a very complicated legal question, but at the same time, it's extremely important from an EU perspective because the EU is a very unique legal order. It cannot act in any way as it wishes when it extends or um, when, it, when it proposes legislation. So it can only act within the, the, the powers that the member states have actually within the competences that the member states have vested in it. Sometimes these are shared competences of the, the, the famous principle of conferral. Um, 
Now, uh, when looking a little bit at copyright and how the EU makes laws in copyright, when I pose this question, is that we actually tie this to um, the establishment of the internal market. The EU doesn't have, doesn't act when it comes to copyright with a copyright related legal basis. The legal basis to pass laws is Article 114 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU. And this is really entirely tied to the goal of establishing and maintaining uh, a good internal market. Now, once the, a copyright expert here says, hang on, how does this work for copyright law? And we, what I do with this paper is that I try to unpack a little bit this functional competence um, of achieving an internal market through the lens of AI, um, uh, generated works. What I argue is that um, regardless of how broad this internal market legislative competence is, there are still some safety valves, I would say. I would, it's very crude to call the proportionality subsidiarity principles as, safe, as safety valves, but uh, in practice I fear that we have sometimes forgotten about them. So um, what I seek to, to actually argue with this paper is that the better regulation principles that exist when we pass legislations, meaning importance of impact assessments, of public consultations, subsidiarity and proportionality principles, should model and, and produce a, an appropriate legislation if we ever decide to extend copyright protection for that kind of works. And this cannot be underlined enough because AI is a very big hype. It has pushed all sorts of institutions, European, national, international, to think about legislating, regulating, expanding IPRs in various forms, IP rights, I mean. Um, and copyright, in my view, and in I, what I tried to argue in this paper, copyright law is not the suitable right to actually balance this internal market when we talk about AI generated works. Um, and the bottom line is that um, once we introduce any legislation, any new IP right, once we extend copyright, it's very difficult to get rid of these rights. It's, it's very difficult to repeal them and they involve a lot of costs of different nature. Um, legislative compliance, um, licensing, and so on and so forth. So it is extremely important to appreciate the complexity of the European Union legislative process. Uh, and for copyright scholars, for IP scholars, this might be even very difficult because we all live in our little bubble, but we should break a little bit these borders. So this is a cautionary paper, I would say, to the to the policymakers and the lawmakers. It's important to think about these things, but also to bear in mind that this legislative competence of the internal market is extremely flexible. Is it's it's called competence, the competence creep competence. Uh, so it can allow for a lot of things that are not necessarily uh, there to be legislated to actually creep into the hands of the legislator. That's the that's the basic idea, basic, I would say. Yeah, I can imagine that summarizing in five minutes something that is as complex is, is a bit of a challenge, but but I think people can appreciate the 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 steps you've taken, which is look at the you know the European Commission and the European Union is defined by the competencies it got from the member states. So let's look at that and see how copyright fits or doesn't when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, now, in in your paper, um, you also argue that copyright law does not, um, and and I'm going to quote you on that, fully benefit authors and artists whose cultural concerns are the essence of copyright law. So basically. A kind of discrepancy between the intention and the result uh, of copyright law, let's say. Uh, instead, you consider that the way uh, copyright relevant le legislation is looked at currently uh, by EU legislators, and I would say also by member states legislators in some cases, benefits only a limited number of what is called the cultural industries. And you refer uh, notably to book and music publishers, 
uh, film producers, broadcasters, the large collecting societies. So can, can you explain what you mean by that discrepancy and, and maybe how it crept in? Of course. Um, no, there is one um, simple way to elaborate a little bit more on this. Um, and it's tied to the way lobbying works and the, and the, the notion of lobbying. It's very effective uh, when you have a presence and a voice in Brussels, when the, the legislative process is taking place. And this is very evident in copyright. Um, it's no surprise to, to many, many of us. Uh, but um, there's a report from several years ago now uh, by um, um, corporate, the Corporate Europe Observatory, uh, where uh, looking at the copyright directive uh, in the digital single market, the, the CDSM directive, um, that report demonstrates the amount of meetings that the creative industry has had with the Commission in the years when the directive was being molded. So this is not, this is, I think, is a span of at least four or five years. And the top place is uh, taken by the music recording industries, then publishers, composers. Um, so it gives us a little bit of an idea of whose voices were loudest. And uh, then when we look at the directive, we figure out the extent to which actually they were reflected because I don't want to be com totally one-sided and, and, and very, very critical. There, uh, the directive changed its wording a lot uh, as a result of discussions, uh, but the, the loudness of the voice of certain players was somewhere here and then others were lost in between. Now, I'd like to add something slightly um, different here and give you a little bit more of a legislative competences argument, since this paper is on legislative competences and you, what, you, what you raised there was their importance and the relevance of cultural concerns. Um, we can all agree that copyright law, IP in general, uh, is designed, should be designed uh, to protect intellective creativity creative expression and in that sense it's not just about the internal market it's not just about making the markets work it's about culture full stop culture as such and diversity as such so in a in an ideal world one would look um, for culture link competence to pass legislations and somehow mold it tie it into the the lawmaking for copyright. Um, we have something more or less appropriate in the face of um, Article 167 of uh, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And that, when you read it, at first it looks great because it says that um, the Union uh, must uh, take cultural aspects into account in all of its actions. Um, and it shall contribute to the flourishing of, uh, uh, of, the, of the European culture and the member states' culture and so on and so forth. However, now becoming, again, very precise on how the legislative process and, and um, shared competences work on an EU level, this is a competence to only support, coordinate and supplement the member states' actions. So the European Union cannot harmonize anything on the basis of this competence. It can only give a little voice to these cultural concerns. And unfortunately, what has been happening with copyright law is that because culture gains, like I, I, at one point in the paper, I say it gains a different flavor depending on the, the industry and depending on the stakeholder you are uh, talking to, um, this competence actually is there. It's always there in all of the directives, but it doesn't add too much. The care for culture is present for sure, but it is somehow subsumed within the strong internal market competence creep and in making a market function and, and establishing one for certain works is taking over and leaves cultural concerns aside. So, Perhaps this is something that we actually can't sort out, we can't deal with at all, because copyright is, it is what it is. It's one thing for me, it will be one a different thing for the record industry, it will be a different thing for publishers. Um, 
but I feel and I'm, I fear that we have forgotten a little bit the cultural concerns um, with the caveat that there's been many wonderful projects which in the last years have sought to, to revitalize this discussion. Um, but when we look at the practical aspect of how law is being made on copyright, I'm not that convinced that we are that concerned with culture as we should be. Yeah, there, there's a, obviously always a danger when EU legislation says that you should take something into account. It's not the strongest language, sadly, uh, in terms of um, motivation. Um, now, you mentioned the lobbies briefly. Um, as you know, the AI Act uh, is currently uh, being adopted, uh, being discussed in the, in, in the legislative process. And... and there's probably there again a symptom of that lobbying with uh, many right holders putting pressure on the European Parliament to add copyright language, uh, even though um, when asked through a parliamentary question, the European Commission uh, answered that it was not needed uh, according to uh, the, the, the copyright unit there. Um, we know that as a result, at the last minute, the European Parliament slid uh, two specific obligations uh, with copyright implications on providers of uh, what they call generative AI models. So ba basically AI models that generate uh, something new. Um, and um, to give the technical place, if people are fascinated, it's under Article 28B sub 5A, because that's how we do legislation <laughs> in Brussels. We add subs and they have a five and a number. Um, so those obligations, as I said, transparency and disclosure on the one hand, content moderation on the other. And one can only think, yeah, transparency, that's a good thing. That's, you know, that's good for the public, that's good for the regulator if they can check what's happening. But the question is, is the standard that's been set in that AI Act at the last minute, is it achievable? Can it be complied with? So can you maybe enlighten um, people with the fact that spotting what is copyrighted and what isn't, isn't maybe always an obvious ta task? Um, because I think everyone thinks it has a little C branded on it and you can spot it from a mile but that's not really the case no most of the times that, that's not really the case indeed um this is an excellent point um and a prime example of what i was actually referring to earlier lobbying uh in particular but i would like to put one one thing very clear before i go into the transparency question uh lobbying is not bad per se but it has to be measured it has to be realistic, proportionate, and most importantly, in my view, backed up with evidence, not just with presence. And very often, unfortunately, in, in many of our discussions on copyright law, this has been missing. It's been very much one-sided. Um, on the specific point uh, with respect to transparency in, uh, in the AI Act, um, my colleague João Pedro Quintas has from the University of Amsterdam has recently published on this and makes this point perfectly clear. I would not even pretend to to be able to say it better than him. Um, but this a very the transparency obligation is extremely difficult to comply with. Um, to be able to actually list all or most of the copyright material an AI generative AI provider is including in their training data is, is, is a good aspiration, but it needs to come with a clear identification of actually who these rights belong to and so on. And this is impossible. This isn't a very old question of, of copyright law, very old issue of, of standard copyright drama that we have difficulty with territorial uh, with territoriality in copyright law uh, so um, this has been pushed even uh, further with digital identifying ownership uh, figuring out whether something is protected to start with because our originality standard is rather low but vague so being able to actually name all of these works um, that one believes are copyright protected, 
in a complete, in, in a clear manner, so that there's a clear identification of the rights holders, is very, very difficult. Um, so I think that uh, we are not talking to each other again, sliding, talking to each other in the sense of people who know how copyright scholars, computer scientists and artists and lawmakers should interact a little bit more. And yes, we've been saying this for many, many times, but now we see the practical difficulties of sliding something last minute in a legislation that is going to have a huge impact. Um, and this is a regulation. This is not a directive in the sense that it will not allow further um, implementation by the member states to actually make this work uh, if they wish to. So it's an act. It's it's a it's called an act, which is you know a different topic of why are we calling EU legislation these days act? Um, I hear that it sounds attractive and sexy, and that's the whole explanation of it. Uh, but it, it, the bottom line is this is a regulation. So from a, from a legal perspective, it's very strong. Putting EU legislation and sexy in the same sentence is a challenge in itself. I'm not sure calling it an act will help, but um, um, you, you mentioned the need to, uh, you know, the fact that lobbying isn't bad per se, but it needs to be based on, on evidence. And I think th the same thing is true for legislation. Uh, and, and I really liked your references in, in, in the paper uh, you wrote to the better regulation principles. Uh, both in terms of impact assessments, but also in terms of outcome of, of, of regulation. And you mentioned the proportionality principle um, uh, also in, in, in your paper. The, the fact that you encourage legislation, legislators to be cautious uh, when looking at regulating an emerging digital technology uh, such as the one behind um, generative AI, AI that create that creates something. I mean, AI that does things has been there for a long time, but a AI that creates things is is a bit newer, or at least AI that creates things for the general public is maybe something uh, that's that's new and and emerging and exciting and. Where do you see um, a risk of uh, what you call using an elephant uh, gun to kill a fly? So, um, everywhere, <laughs> full stop. Um, but uh, no, be, let's be a little bit more precise. In, in the EU, I say everywhere because in the EU, we like regulating. And it feels like these days, every data AI linked aspect is being regulated to the extent that we um, we allegedly, the experts in the field, of copyright IP, data protection data, we are lost. We are lost, let alone the public and the those that will have to actually work with these regulations. So it was very interesting that at a, at a recent copyright uh, conference, there were some representatives from the commission and they were invited to discuss all these AI data linked legislation with academics. And the consensus amongst all of us, including them was clear. We are all very tired. It is all very difficult to make sense of all of these pieces of regulations and directives, which, uh, as, it, as I said before, we oddly call sometimes acts um, and they have to work together. We can no longer pretend that one piece of legislation will be without any prejudice to anything that was done before or will be done after. They will have to talk to each other as legal documents. Um, so I fear that we are rushing things too much. Um, I'm very much aware that the EU legislative process is slow and technology is fast. And we need to actually keep up with it. Uh, and legislation can no longer be slow. But we have examples in, in, in European Union IP uh, where we have killed a fly with an elephant gun. Um, the, the database directive is one prime example. Um, and the IP landscape in the EU is just so complicated at the moment. Um, 
but it has to make sense to the public. It has to make sense to those that will be protected by that uh, legislation. Copyright law is this is especially true for copyright law. So um, my my references to the better regulation, to proportionality uh, and subsidiarity, but proportionality more than more than anything, uh, taking it seriously and taking those appropriateness uh, steps of an, any legislation that is molded, um, they need to not just be an exercise that we take off. Uh, so we need to carry out those impact assessments and public consultations properly and genuinely in, seek to engage with people because putting it out there is not enough. There's been public consultations that haven't produced good results and the consensus is, oh, we don't have enough data. You've put so much effort into putting it together. I know that it's very easy to say, oh, but people didn't reply. We, we, we can, when you ask people about copyright law, they have an opinion. Uh, you, we just need to figure out uh, how to extract this. And there's many centers that are actually carrying out important empirical work um, with respect to the public opinion, the CREATE Center at the University of Glasgow is, is one excellent example. Um, but having said that, um, I think the tech side, the, the, the practicality of it, the, the discussion with computer scientists who tell us this is excellent, but it doesn't work in practice. Um, doesn't work at all technically is somehow missing, and I think the the the, the points that you raised earlier on, on, on transparency um, are, are are very good uh, examples of these flaws. So we need to work together um, to find meaningful ways to actually not kill a fly <laughs> with an elephant gun. Yeah, w w when you made the remark about computer scientists, I always think of the expression "nerd harder." which is what you feel like legislators think when someone tells them, well, that's not feasible technically, but nerd harder, you know, try more technology can solve all. Um, Alina, thank you so much. I think this, this is extremely helpful um, and, and it saves uh, people reading your article. I still encourage them to read it though, because there's details in there that, that really make the point come alive, uh, the points that you made. Um, I take from, from, from your contribution, less knee-jerk reactions, more thinking, more talking to each other. Um, if, if the end goal is to protect cultural diversity, to protect creators, there's a lot of people in the room that want to achieve that and you know make them uh, build bridges uh, towards each other and, and make them work together on solutions that are feasible. <laughs> Uh, and no, technology is not magic. It will not solve everything. So, so we need to think beforehand and not just expect things to magically um, uh, be addressed uh, once a legislator has thought about them. Uh, I hope that makes sense as a, as a summary. Thank you so much for your contribution. And uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about AI and copyright for a long time. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that's going to be the case. Uh, it's been great talking to you. And uh, I hope this makes a little bit more sense now. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. It will probably not for a while. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day, Alina.